Hey there, Rock and Roll Junkies, Charlie here. Another Grey Wolf review. This episode, Metallica's album, Hardwired to Self Destructs. I'm here wearing my Metallica shirt, my Ride the Lightning shirt, just for this. It's my favorite Metallica album, actually. One day I'll review that. But for the time being, uh, we're gonna focus on Hardwired. Don't mind the hair, I gotta cut again because I'm a poser. So, this is gonna be a long one. It'll be a real long one, got a lot of things to cover, let's just get right into it. But as, you know, as I always go to, my history with the band. Now, the first time I heard Metallica was in eighth grade. I remember the first song I ever heard was Master of Puppets, and I did not like that song. I didn't like it at all. That same year, I heard uh, Psychosocial by Slipknot, and I didn't like that song either. <laughs> I guess at that time, I thought that was just that was too heavy for me, and I just didn't like either song. It didn't work for me. It was it was too much, which is funny when you think about it now. When I look back at, at it, on <laughs> both those songs are... I mean, I've listened to way more extreme metal songs than Master of Puppets or Psychosocial, and they just seem like soft now compared in, in comparison. But I listened to uh, Master of Puppets in 8th grade, did not like it. It wouldn't be until years later, I guess in 10th grade, that's when I really start to appreciate all forms of uh, rock music. And I really got into Metallica that year, I really got into Ride the Lightning, the Black Album. Kill Em All didn't get into a little bit later, which is weird. The first album I didn't get into until after the fact. And, uh, and, and Justice For All, basically the first four albums plus uh, Black Album. Those are the ones that I mostly focused on. I actually listened to a few things from Load to Reload, and to this day I have I haven't actually listened to Load to Reload like completely from beginning to end. I have not listened to them. I kind of don't care to. I will though now that I've started this channel. I probably will. But for the time being, I have not listened to those albums from beginning to end because everybody says, "Don't do it, don't do it." So I haven't done it. And then Saint Anger. Oh God, I've never I've never listened to Saint Anger either. I've listened to the song. St. Anger of the song. I think it's okay. I mean, it's not good at all, but it's, it's good worse. And then Death Magnetic, I don't remember Death Magnetic. I have listened to it multiple times, but it, the last time I heard it would have to be four or five years ago, like completely. I liked some of it. I didn't think it was perfect. I didn't think it was horrible. I just thought it was okay. From what I remember, at least. Maybe I've changed my mind since then, so I'll have to listen to that album again and hopefully review it. But then, this album, Hardwired. I remember when they announced it, I was pretty excited for it because I really, really, really love Metallica. You know, as far as their first four albums go, I just worship those albums. They mean so much to me, so I was really hyped for this album. It was Pronta is being like the return of Metallica, the return back to our roots. We're gonna go back to the thrash, man. And I mean, doesn't everyone say that? Like with their new album, oh, we're gonna go back to our roots. But it's not always so. So I was a little skeptical about it. And I remember basically uh, all, all the hype that led up to it. People were just so excited, so excited, dying, just dying to hear a Metallica album because. The last one, Death Magnetic, was in 2008, and this was 2016, so it's eight years people have been waiting, almost a decade for Metallica to put something out. And we got Hardwired to Self-Destruct. So let's get into the Hardwired to Self-Destruct with the first song, Hardwired. Now I remember when Hardwired came out, it came out uh, the single, August 18th, 2016. I was in school, I was reading Blabbermouth on my phone and you know it was announced a new song came out. I was like, oh cool. I was slightly excited. Uh, class ended and I listened to it and I heard the song and I ooh, I didn't like it. Mm -mm, nope. I did not like it. I liked the speed of it, I liked the music I guess, but the song like lyrically I just found it to be dumb. Like naive not naive, I'm sorry, uh, mediocre. I found the song to be mediocre and repetitive and just juvenile. That's the word juvenile. I didn't like the chorus. I didn't like the lyrics. I I really like James' voice, his delivery on the song and uh, the music behind it, but I didn't like the song at all. 
But now, now I do like this song a lot. And all those things that I said before that I didn't like, I love now. I love the chorus now. It's really powerful. I love the lyrics now. I love James' delivery. It's very fast, very thrash, very, very like punk vibe throughout this whole song. I love how short it is. It's just short and simple and to the point. It's not like this 10 minute song. It gets in, it gets out. I love that part where James is like, go! And the band goes, turn! They do that a lot. They've done that in um, Damaging. And they do that into another song on this album, Moth into Flame, where he goes, burn! And they just go into it. I just love when he does that. This one, this one does remind me of something off of the first album, off of Kill em All. The solo here is something like you hear on Kill em All. Uh, the solo is, is a little bit short, but then again, the song is pretty short. I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you this right now. The the guitar work here is interesting. It's all in standard tuning, but the solo, the solos are kind of lackluster, and that all has to do really with Kirk. I feel he really dropped the ball with this album. Uh, James went on to say how you know he wasn't that involved with this album and you know Kirk in this whole oh I lost my phone with all my riffs and I couldn't remember any so when it came time to make the album I had to basically improv them all and you hear that a lot in this album that all the solos just feel like they came just out of nowhere some of them worked I'm not gonna lie some of them do work pretty good some of them don't work and Kirk I don't know what he's doing. Live, he's been changing, like, look, on the studio album, he improv the solos. And then live, some of the songs, he's improv them too, so he's changing the solo again. And some songs have fine solos on the album. They're not fantastic, but they were fine. Now live, he's doing a new thing and it's kind of ruining them. And then he's going on about how, oh, that was the whole point. I, I just so good at improv it, you know? All these other Metallica songs, well, you reuse the one with the first take that I made, so, you know, I'm just so good at improv. I'm just like these other people, all these blues guitars that would improv. I'm just, I'm just like, he's trying to make it seem like it was on purpose, but it's not. We all know you lost your phone. We all know you brought nothing to the table. We all know you improv them. Just accept it, but stop changing them blind. I mean, it, it is what it is. You can't fix it, just leave them be. Uh, <laughs> I got a little distracted there with the whole Kirk thing. But this song, however, Hardwired, great song, great song, fantastic, powerful. It was written last, which is interesting. So that means they didn't plan to this album Hardwired to self-destruct until this one came out last. And well, this one came, the, the title came from a friend of James who is a recovering addict. I think the story was that he told them that men are just hardwired, you know, Hardwired to do things, hardwired to eat, hardwired to fall apart. Just sometimes men are just hardwired to self-destruct. They just look for things to kill them almost. And James heard that and he really liked the whole hardwired to self-destruct thing. It feels like a lot of people are are like that, but I think he said the message on the album is that, you know, even though the world isn't you know a good place right now and it might be falling apart. And it is hardwired to self-destruct. At least, you know, we're all gonna go down together. It's like a communal, communal, communal thing. I think I said that right about being together. And even if everything is falling apart, the whole world is falling apart. At least we're gonna go down together. That's a that's a pretty cool thing. Then we go into the second song, guys, which is Atlas Rise. Love this song. October 31st, 2016 it was the third single. That's when it came out. Now, this song, I liked it at first. I like the last one, Hardwired, where I didn't like it. This one, I did like it at first. Everybody said it had this Iron Maiden vibe going to it. And yes, I heard the Iron Maiden thing. And maybe that's why I liked it. But unlike a modern day Iron Maiden song, it doesn't go on forever. It doesn't outstay its welcome. It is long, but it's it flows very, very well. And as I said before, I liked it, you know, and as, now this album came out in November, this was October 31st. By this point, Hardwired was actually my favorite song at first. Like I actually started to appreciate it more. By the time the album came out, Hardwired was my favorite song. 
But now, since then, Hardwired is not my favorite song, and Atlas Rise is my favorite song on the entire album. I love this song. Lyrically, it's great. I love the story of Atlas, and it's telling you know how he was condemned by Zeus to hold up the sky. James's vocal delivery is great, how he sings the whole thing. It's easy, it's very easy to sing along to. It's great live. The chorus and the melody is nice. It has a very melodic solo, I love it. The drums kind of remind me of maybe something off and Justice for All. There's, there's just this like one part in the song um, that I kind of don't like. I think it's this song. I don't know if it's this one or that Moth into Flame. No, it's not this song. I'm thinking about something else. But let's see. Now, you know, the story with Atlas having to hold up the sky. James said that this was, uh, reminded him of Lars a lot now. Lars had a lot of this uh, tension and a lot of like, things that he had to carry and he feels that a lot of people are like that. You know, they go around all the time with all these things, all these burdens, and they're always like complaining about them because they have to carry all this. So it's, James is like, why don't you, you pass me some of that burden? Let me carry some of that, let me help you out. And really, that's a, it's pretty cool, you know, that message is trying to get to, to the story of Atlas. And that being said, it's a great song. The drums are great, you know. I think everybody keeps, keeps putting down Lard, but I think it's a great song. And that's all I have to say for that one. It's a great song. It's my favorite song on the album. Now the third song, Now That We're Dead. Now That We're Dead. It gets you, it gets you hooked right from the second it starts. It has a great intro. Reminds me of classic Metallica, that intro. Lyrically, it flows great. James, again, is great. One thing to notice here, there is no solo to be found here. I don't know, Kirk was just like, he did prop so much that he just gave up. Everybody was like, no. I don't know, but I don't think it needs a solo. It has great production, this song. This whole album has great production. It does remind me of something from the 90s, something maybe from the Black Album, but something good from the Black Album. I don't love the Black Album, I think it's okay. I don't think it's the worst thing ever like a lot of people do. I think it's a good song. Uh, another thing I want to say that most of the riffs on this album, James came up with, not Kirk, because of course the phone. And you know, it's a pretty cool riff going here. I love the part near the end where there's, there's just no vocals at all, it's just the instruments and just going to really cool. Uh, again, the intro is great. It's a little short, but it's great. It just gets you hooked. Go right into it. I love that about the song. So the next song here, number four, is Moth Into Flame. Now Moth Into Flame. This is a really, really interesting song. Now this song, hmm, let's see. I think this was the second solo, the second single I meant to come out. And I didn't, I didn't like this one at first. I didn't, it didn't do anything for me. It, it was kind of like long and it felt repetitive, which is the same thoughts I had for Hardwired at first. I didn't like it, it was long, it was repetitive. I was scared the whole album was gonna be this way. I was like, oh my god, is the whole album gonna be long and repetitive? Because I, I learned that Hardwired was written last. So I mean, oh wait, so all these other songs are written written? So they're all gonna be long and repetitive? Oh no. And you know, after a while, I learned to appreciate this song. And now, now I think it's a fantastic song. It's a great song. It's an amazing song. Of course, you know, the song is... has a great, great opening riff. And the vocal melody is great. Like I said before, in the hard wire, when he says, Go! And the whole band comes in, he goes, he goes Burn! And the whole band goes in. Uh, the, solo, the solo here is... Maybe I should hear it again, but I thought it could be better. I thought it could be a little bit better. Uh, I love the chorus here. Again, the song is long, but it's worth it. Oh my god, you know, I made this song. It's a really good song. September 22nd, 26 is where it came out. You know, the first song was August, September. By this point, I think I had warmed up more to Hardwired, but I was still super critical of Moffat to play. It's a great song. I think this song has a lot going for it that a lot of people just don't give it credit. Like, the, the whole lyric, lyrically, if you listen to it lyrically, it's about this desire most people have to be famous. 
And no, ma no matter the cost, people, you know, strive or just like drawn to it like a moth into a flame. But what they don't know is like, like the, those bug zapper things, like, you know, a little bug goes through and, and it zaps and dies. You're drawn to that light. You don't know that that light's gonna kill you. You don't know that this is basically drawing you to your, to your downfall and the fame is the light and you're going to it and you're, you're gonna, it could kill you. And uh, James wrote this, he was, uh, it wasn't completely about Amy Winehouse, but he was watching the Amy Winehouse documentary and, you know, I gave him a lot to work with. He saw the documentary, thought her story was very sad, how she let the fame just get to her head. The story here, a month into fame, is about this pop queen who, who crashes and burns and because of all, it's all the fame has got to her head, I and mean, James just sees this, you know, people just being addicted to the fame, and it's like, you could say that it's just celebrity, but it's not, James is like, you see this every day. You see people on their phones every day. You see people just taking selfies constantly, constantly, this narcissism, this, you know, desire for approval from everyone, and you're like a moth and do this artificial light, and the fame is artificial itself, and you're just, you're just you know, addicted to the fame. Like the song says, and the fame is just gonna kill you again. And that's why I think the song lyrically is fantastic. You know, I think a lot of people don't don't really uh, give heavy metal music the credit it deserves because they just think it's loud music. But uh, with what they did here with James, what he did here with this song, he, you know, he's saying a lot here. And I feel that people need to take. Uh, more consideration to uh, what these guys can do, what anybody can do within the heavy metal genre. So let's move in to the next song. Let's see what it is. Now this is the fifth song, guys. Dream no more. Now this is a pretty cool song. I really like this song. It's got this slow plotting vibe. Logo delivery is great again. Lyrics flow very well. There's like a pause in this line. Kind of, I really love that pause because then it speeds up afterwards. It's very good. Drums are so good, you know, it slows down another time again, and it's just, it's really good. And it has like this haunting ending. I, I just, I love it. I love it so much. Now let's see here. Again, this song is about Cthulhu. And Cthulhu awaking and Cthulhu answering the call. And you know, it's a simple little song that at first I didn't really care about, but now, after having the album from November till now, I really, really dig this song. It's a great song. And, you know, I should have started it off by saying this, but this album is going to be a little bit polarizing, the review that I'm doing here. A lot of people either love this album from what I've seen or hate this album from what I've seen. And I'm not either of those parties. I feel I'm going to meet you people halfway. Like, I'm going to love part of it, but I'm not going to like all of it. I'm not going to trash it, but I'm not going to worship it either. It might seem that way because, you know, these first four songs I really, really like, but trust me, it's, it's very polarizing, my thoughts on this. All right, guys, so the next song here is Halo on Fire. Halo on Fire. Now, this is a special song. This is a song that I, I kind of liked at first. It reminded me of Unforgiven, and for that reason, it, rock, it rubbed me the wrong way. I don't really care for Unforgiven 1, 2, 3, 4, 10, 20, 30. I was kind of scared that we're gonna do another Unforgiven on this album. I was praying, do not do another Unforgiven, please. And they did this one instead. And um, again, I didn't really care for it at all. When it came out, when the album came out, I didn't care for this song at all. I mean, it th I thought it was okay. I didn't hate it. I just didn't care for it. I usually, usually skipped it. And when I listened to this album again for this review, I listened to the song, right? And I did not. I felt the same way. I, I didn't really care. I kind of, kind of liked it maybe like one percent more than before. So what I did was I was like, hey, you know what? Sometimes, sometimes songs are better live. Like they translate better live. So I, I searched a, a live version of it, the most recent live version of it, and I really liked it. I really, really, really liked the live version. It was fantastic. So then I went back and listened to the studio version. And then, I don't know, but now I really, really like the studio version. Like, I went from just barely caring about it to now loving it. I love, 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 love this song. And that is so weird. That's never happened to me. Where I don't care for a song and then I look at it. In the same day, I just completely changed my mind over it. There's another song in this album where I kind of changed my mind. 
kind of in that way. You'll see when we get there. But for the most part, uh, this song is fantastic. James is delivering his voice throughout this whole song. Really delivers it. I love how soft he can get his voice and then how rough he can get it, you know. A lot of passion in this delivery. It is strong, you know, has a lot of changes. Sometimes it speeds up, sometimes it slows down. But I think it's really, it's really, really, really cool. Just all the things it does. Like the first time I heard it, uh, the solo, I thought it was okay. There's, like, I think there's like two solos in here. The first one is okay. The second one is really, really good. And like I said about current changing things, uh, if you look at old uh, performances of it of this song, he would improv the solo, and it wasn't that great. So now he's going back to the original studio solo. That's what I'm talking about, Kurt. You, you really just gotta stop, stop doing that. Stop improvising things and just let it be. Another thing I'm gonna say about Metallica, they have this horrible tendency of like teasing people. Like with this song, when I saw this performance of Halo on Fire, they started it off with the Call of Cthulhu, like a little bit, and they stopped and they went to Halo on Fire. Um, they gotta stop doing that. That's annoying when they tease people like that. I heard that on the, I think it was the Load and the Reload tour, they did something similar where they played an old song, just the first bit of it, and they stopped and then went into a more like modern old song. Which is that is just horrible thing to do to tease people like that. And that's just this little thing I have to say about Metallica. Uh, I'm gonna say, yeah, that this song, at first I thought it was, see, I have my notes here, and I wrote that, the first time I listened to this song, I thought it was decent and had potential. But now I just think it's, it's fantastic. It's like, I don't know what I wasn't hearing the first time I heard it, or maybe the last time I heard it. I don't know what I'm saying anymore, but I just wouldn't say that I just, I love, love, love this song. It's so weird what would happen to me with this song. Now let's see what I have here. Okay, well James says this song is is about how there's, you know, there's good in all of us, and there's also evil, but it doesn't know when to show itself, it doesn't know how to portray itself to people. So sometimes people portray themselves as saints when really there's like this darkness inside of them and, and they're just hiding it. James uh, <laughs> even mentioned Fifty Shades of Grey, how this guy, he like, he's this business guy, he comes off so suave, and in reality he's, he has like this darkness to him, he likes to keep people in a dungeon and do things with him. I would have never uh, thought of that analogy, but that's what he said, and I, I get it, I get it. You know how people portray themselves as something, but they're not, like they're two-faced. It's, it's an interesting concept they did here, and I really, I really just love this song. Love, love, love this song. And this, guys, this finishes the first side of the album. Whenever you saw the first side of the album, I basically love every single song on it. So now we move on to the second side of the album, guys, and this is where everything goes downhill. I don't like the second half of the album, guys. I'm gonna tell you, most a good 95% of it I do not like. So guys, here we are, we're on side two now. Side two of the album, and it starts off with song number seven, which is Confusion. Now, when I looked at the songs live, like Halo on Fire, I looked at all the other songs that they've played live thus far, this song, Confusion, is the only song that they've played live from the side of the album, which is interesting enough. Uh, I'm gonna have to tell you something, but I don't really care for the side of the album. And this is a song that I, I, I um, probably like the most from this album, from this side of the album, I'm just gonna look, I'm gonna just tell you again, the spoiler here, I love Spit Out the Bone. Now, let's let's forget Spit Out the Bone even exists on this side, okay? Let's forget it, it doesn't exist. And then I think Confusion is the best song on this side of the album. I don't think, okay, it's not the best song, it's the song that I dislike the least. Let's put it like that, because I don't like any of these songs. See, I'm trying to word it here so it doesn't offend people. I don't think these songs are bad. I just do not care for them. A lot of them get on my nerves, but I don't think they're bad because I've heard bad songs that just make me sick. This doesn't make me sick. I just don't care for it. I don't like it. I don't want to hear it. Um, Enter Sandman, that's a good example. I think Enter Sandman is a good song. I just don't want to hear it ever again. I'm done with it. Burned down. I don't care for it. Uh, nothing else matters. I don't care for that song. 
I think it's a good song, but I don't care for it. And I feel the same way with these songs in this album, Confusion. I think it has a nice, heavy intro with the drums, right? It has a Black Album vibe, and that's not my problem with it. I mean, maybe it is, I don't know. It probably is. <laughs> it reminds me of Wherever, wherever I Be Wrong. This is a song I usually skip. Again, it's not bad, I just don't care for it. It is nothing special, guys. Nothing special. It has a cool riff, but it's varied by the numbers at this point. The drums here, the drums here are impressive. I'm, I'll give you that. And, God, it's just so difficult at this point with this album. I don't know what to tell you. This album was just doing so well, and then we got it at this point. Oh, well, let me see what I have here for confusion. Well, of course, it's about PTSD. It's about how these soldiers come home and try to deal with it. Uh, James referenced American Sniper, the film, and how you know, that guy struggled with it. But, you know, there's always PTSD. He says, you know, being in a band is PTSD. Because you always have to go places, then you have to, like, see people, and sometimes you just get so stressed from it that it really, it's hard to go back to normal day life and just be a normal person, not have to tour, because you know, when you tour, people say you have to be here at this time, you have to be he here at this time, you have to do this at this time, you have to do the show at this time. And you kind of get used to that, and then when you're done with the tour, you go back to normal life, you're kind of like, oh, what do I do with myself? Which reminds me of like Ozzy when he had the no more, no more tours, and he stopped touring, and he was like, well, what do I do with my life? And he went back to touring. So I kind of get what he's, where he's coming with that one. And with that being said, we move on to the next song, which is. Man Unkind. Um, I don't like it. Like I said before, it has a nice bass intro. Mm. The solo, I, it's okay. Um, I like the drums. It's the same thing as the last one. I find it bland. I don't care for it. Uh, there's a part that goes dominate. Da -na -na, da -na -na. I like that part. The solo here. Can I say I like the solo? It's weird because I, I think uh, here I have written in my notes the solo is noise. I don't know what that means. I don't remember, but it's, I don't remember the song, guys. It's somewhat forgettable. It's just, oh god. It's just like the last one, Confusion. I don't care for it. Uh, the message here is you have to have. Faith in mankind instead of blaming mankind. You have to have passion for others that are struggling to. And uh, it's a good message. I think there's a one that I just don't care for. I believe is the one that Robert Trujillo worked on. And this was his idea. The, um, I don't remember at this point, I'm sorry. I just, these songs, when I was listening to this album, it was such a struggle to get through. Such a struggle, honest to God. They're not bad, I just, it became all like the same song, they all started to mix and become the same thing, it was just exhausting for me. Oh, so here we go to the next song, which is Here Comes Revenge. I like the intro, don't love it, I like the intro. The same as the last one, though, it's pretty boring. It's, it just, at this point in the album, I'm like, this This is beyond redemption, I, I just won't end. Somebody, please, just... Please, I need this to end. <laughs> it's about wanting revenge, guys. It's very simple. It's about wanting revenge and praying for it and thinking it's the answer. When at the end of the day, it's not. It was inspired by this couple. They're friends of the band, the friends of James, and their daughter was killed by a drunk driver. And James was like, if that was my daughter, if I was in their place, I'd be wishing for revenge on the guy who killed me. My daughter, I'd be waiting for revenge, I'd be praying for it. He says that that would be his reaction. But he says that this couple has been dealing with it really well. They don't wish for revenge, you know, and they're... He says that's, that's very nice of them, but I wouldn't be that way. I'd be, you know, wishing for revenge. And, uh... That, that's, that's it. I can't really say anything here, man. At this point, I'm really... I'm just really burned out with this album. I'm so burned out. <laughs> And then I looked at the, I looked at my thing, and I was just like, "Oh my God, it's still going. We still have more to go through." <sighs> okay, so then we go to, "Am I Savage?" Now this is a song I really didn't like the first time I heard it, and I still don't. 
Nope, there's nothing here, man. I don't like the name. It reminds me of Am I Evil? I don't like the chorus, I don't like the solo. It, it, this, it's like a chore here, guys. Why is this a double album? Why? It's too long, it's not necessary. Why? I have like nothing to say here, Primal Savage. Oh my god, okay, well, let's see what I wrote here. The Line Inheritance. Okay, well, James says that there's this line here in the song where it mentions inheritance. Uh, the past has been again. I think I remember that song. James was thinking of naming the album. Oh, James was thinking of naming this album Inheritance instead of uh, Hardwired. He was playing with the idea of it. So, you know, like in life, you inherit a lot of things. Uh, as a person, you inherit uh, from your parents, you know, the looks, your. a lot of things, the blood, a lot of things from your parents. And then you. You as a person, you, know, you grow up and you want to be your own person. He, with his son, he's trying not for his son not to be like him. So he's like pushing him towards doing things that he wouldn't do and telling him, hey, look, my dad didn't let me do this. Or my dad wouldn't make me do this. So why don't you do this? It'd be different for me. But then, you know, he learned that he's got to let the kid do what he wants. He has to back off, let the kid blossom, and, you know, become his own person without you pushing him to be different from you. Or without you pushing him to be like you, just let him be. And that's what he said uh, about this song. Sometimes he feels like he's being savage, he's being too much with the kid. And again, it's a nice message, but I just don't care. I don't care. I'm gonna take a little, a little pause here. And, uh... Oh, breather. This is this album is something else, guys. This is something else. Oh god. Okay. Okay, so now we are at Murder One. Oh my god, Murder One. At this point, when I was listening to the album, I was just like exhausted. I was just so tired. I was like, this album has drained everything from me. Not bad songs, guys. I just, they do nothing for me. So Murder One, this is a song I told you that, like uh, Halo on Fire, how Halo on Fire had, I, I didn't like it at first. Now I listened to it again, and I changed my mind, and now I love it. This song is the same thing, but in reverse. This is a song I actually liked at first. I liked the song at first, but after time, I learned to not like it. I like, went back, and. Now I don't like it. I don't like the song now. Uh, okay, so I know it was announced before the album came out that this song would be about Lemmy. I know that, okay. And I went into it and I heard all the Lemmy influences on here, heard all the references, and I, I liked that. I liked it because I thought it was a nice gesture at first. But after hearing it for some time, I just realized this isn't a good tribute to the guy. For example, let's, let's start off with the most, the most obvious thing here. This song is too slow, man. It's like the rest of this album. The rest of Side 2 is too slow. It's too slow for its own good. And my, that's my problem with this song. You can't do a song, a tribute to Lemmy, to Motorhead, and make it so slow, man. It was like, what is this? It's so slow. Look, when Lemmy did the tribute to the Ramones, he did it, man. It was like fast. It was very punk in nature. Very much, you know, to do justice to the Ramones. But this thing is too slow. It lyrically, look, I liked the lyrics at first. I thought, oh my god, look at all the references. Oh my god, look, the name, the name of the song is called Murder One. Which is, you guys, you know, if you don't know, it's um, Murder One was the name of one of Lemmy's amps. He had, he had a few. He had one called No Remorse, another one called Killer, and another one called Murder One. No remorse, I think it blew up. Yeah, let me say that he replaced it with Marsha. But Murder One was his favorite amp. He had it for like 30 years. And uh, then he retired it. But it was his favorite one. And you know how Metallica always say, like, without Lemmy, there would be no Metallica. Yes, that, that is true. I totally believe that. He pioneered him and Waterhead, basically, the speed metal sound. So when I heard that they were gonna do this, I was excited because like, if all, look, of all the people to do, a tribute to Lemmy, Metallica, Thrash Band, all that, it's perfect, but then they come out with this slow thing, and I'm like, what is this? <sighs> Everything, man, it's just, ugh. 
lyrically, as I said, I thought it was nice, all the references, but now I, they just feel so forced. There's like a, a song with just Easter eggs. It comes off very mediocre, man. Somewhat cringeworthy at times. It, the solo is so bland. It, the song just... It brought me the wrong way now. And it's a song I used to like because I thought it was nice gesture, but now I'm like, it just comes off so lazy. So lazy. And now, guys, move on to the last song of the album. Thank God, Spit Out the Bone. You should see me when we got to this song. I was so happy. My notes literally just say, yes. It's like, oh my God, thank God I was going to die here. I thought I was going to die listening to this song, to these songs in this album. Look, I'm going to say something here about this side too. These songs are bad songs. If you're going to think I think they're bad, they're not bad. They're just, they all start to mix together. They feel like one song started and it never ended because they're all just mid-tempo. Mid-tempo isn't a bad thing, but I feel like they didn't work hard enough on them. They, they feel bland, they feel monotonous, they feel boring, like they don't go anywhere. Like lyrically, there's something there, but just the way the song was constructed, I just don't care for them. I don't care for them. And I'm happy that Confusion's the only one that's ever played live. I hope they drop Confusion also. I just don't care for these songs. And I know there's people, there's people out there who love the songs on side two. I don't. And there's people who hate the songs on side two. I don't hate them. I just don't care for them. I don't care for them. And now we're at Spit Out the Bong, which is a song that saved my life, guys. Oh my god, it's so loud. It's in your face. It's so thunderous. The drums go brrrr. And you're just like, oh my god, you're alive again. You're so alive again. James is so aggressive with his vocals. Completely saved my sanity in this song. The bass part in the middle is great. So great. Yeah, very reminiscent of uh, something Cliff Burton would do. I'm just like... <laughs> I wrote here my notes. Wow, an actual good solo on side two. What? It's crazy. There's some good solos on side two. I don't remember them, but I, I know there's some on there. There has to, there has to be, guys. Right? There has to be. There's a, there's a part of the song that slows down and it speeds up. I love that. It has a very the solo I hear, like classic Metallica solo. I think, yeah, I think Kurt really, really tried on this one. He did a great job on it. Fantastic, just absolutely fantastic song. A lot of people uh, like to say this is their, the best song on the album. And uh, I'm not gonna argue with you. Do I, I don't think it's the best song on the album. I don't really know, maybe it is the best song on the album. It's not my favorite, but as you know, my favorite of something, the best of something, and we are two different things. If you say this is the, the favorite song on the album, if you say this is the best song on the album, I'm not gonna argue with you, this is a great song. Fantastic. And now the song, here's some interesting things about the song. The title was taken from a, from a 1982, uh, it's a lyric from a song from the band GBH. They are this punk band. Again, this uh, album has a sort of a punk influence going in it, in it from James here. It's from their 1982 debut album, City Baby Attacked by Rats. <laughs> I've never heard of this band, GBH, but I'll take a look at them after listening to this. I think it's from the song Passenger on the menu. I think the lyric goes, had no choice, lost, sing, alone, eat the flesh, spit out the bone. And uh, I guess James is a big fan and he decided to use that as the name of the song. Now, if you actually look at the song, it's about, I think this plane crashed and the people ate, but it ended up being cannibals to survive. This song doesn't have to do with that. This is basically about like a, a Terminator future with the downfall of mankind. And if you see, there's like this theme going on with this album about how you know, humanity's in a bad place right now and there might be a time where it all falls apart and then, you know, the robots take over. I think it's like the theme going on here. Because you see technology is like advancing so much, we might get to a point where you don't really actually need to use your own bones and they just become obsolete and they break. And I just, you know, I think it's a great song. It's a fantastic song. Everything about it is so perfect. It sounds very much like a classic, classic Metallica song. You could put this song back in the 80s and nobody would tell them. I even heard like this remix of it, making it sound like something else. Like and Justice for All, and it sounded great. So, I mean, for the proof, this song could be from the 80s, and you could totally see nobody would even question it. It's just a great song. Ending this album, aside to. <laughs> oh, what can I say now for y'all? What can I say? 
Do I think it's a good album? Mm, yes. Yes, I do. Would I recommend this? Yes, and I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. The first half of the album, the first half plus Spit Out the Bone is amazing. It's great work. Probably some of the best thing Metallica have done in decades, just decades. Great work. Side two of the album isn't that good. Outside of Spit Out the Bone, it's not that good. I don't care for it. But the first half is so good. That and Spit Out the Bone, maybe even just Spit Out the Bone, is just so good. It's completely makes the rest of it like obsolete. Like you don't need to even care for it because it's just so good the first half that it makes the rest, the rest worth it. Which is funny, like I was listening to this album and it kind of, this, the album itself reminded me of Metallica. <laughs> like how you know the first four Metallica albums to me at least are, are fantastic. And then there's that point in the 90s where it kind of starts going downhill. Right, and they've been kind of going downhill since then. And then at the end, Metallica, like current day Metallica, has a comeback with this album. And they're, they're you know, great again. And people love and respect them again. I feel this album is like that. Like the first half of the album is good. It's fantastic, like the first four Metallica albums. And then side two is kind of like the downfall of Metallica, like the 90s. And then Spit Out the Bone is like hardwired, the comeback. And I don't think it's on purpose. They, they probably did. They're not that. I'm not gonna give them that much credit. They probably did it. For example, Spit Out the Bone. Lars said he had an idea of making this the opening track. Until, you know, they came up with Hardwired, they came up with that song last, and they were like, you know, this song should be first. So that, that by default, put Spit Out the Bone last. So I don't think they actually planned that out. Maybe that's just me, I'm just reaching here. But that's what I see with this album. The album reminds me of just Metallica itself, and I just think, just like, look, Metallica is one of my favorite bands of all time. They're in my top 10 bands of all time. Look, guys, I have this bag. This is Metallica on oh, it. I just love Metallica. I've got, like, a ton of these shirts. Uh, I got here my first Metallica shirt here. This is my first Metallica shirt. Got this. I've had this for four years. It says Motor Breath on the back. It's kind of, like, fading now. It's kind of, like, a stain and everything, but I love this thing. Love Metallica. Love Metallica. But why? Why do I love Metallica? Why are they in my top 10? Because of the first four albums and they're just so good, but so good, but so good. Puts them on this like legendary status for me. That no matter what they do post the first four albums, will not tarnish the legacy that they have. Because it's just so good, the first four, that it makes them exempt from anything. And it really, it's not just me. Just look at it, Metallica, first four albums, perfect, right? And the 90s, the Black Album, it's, it's okay. People think it as a sellout move, but okay. Then they do the, the load, the reload, which are really just like, from what I've been told, because again, I haven't heard them, they're not good, and they're kind of like, bad, and... Here's the thing, guys. Metallica, we're still doing really good, like, selling out arena, the stadium and stuff. Even with the load or reload albums, and even with St. Anger, I'm like, I feel like Metallica is like, you can't, you can't hurt them. They can put out the worst things ever. Even when they did the, the Lulu thing with Lee Rude, who read? <laughs> they were still like headlining stadiums and stuff. So you can't touch them. They can put out the worst things ever, and people will still worship them. And I think it's all really because of the legacy of the first four albums. Or you know, some people don't like End Justice. So let's just say the legacy of the first three albums. Cannot argue that the legacy of the first three albums, at least, left this you know just this mark on history of just music, not even just heavy metal music, just on music in general. And it just, it's such a big impact that Metallica can do whatever they want. And they're still gonna be huge. And that's the same thing with me. Metallica, the impact of the first four albums is so big on me that I still put them in my top 10 bands of all time. I still worship them. And the same thing can be said about this album. That just the impact, the first half of this album, because Spit Out the Bone is so good that I highly recommend you listen to it and dissect it. I did really, you know, I went deep and I looked up the meaning of the songs and stuff so I can appreciate them more, but look, I did, I tried so hard here to like side two, I tried, man, I, you can't say I didn't try, I tried, I looked at the meaning, I looked up how they made up the songs, I looked up everything, it just didn't work for me. So I, you can't just say I'm hating it to hate it, I really did try, but the first half is so amazing. Let's put out the bone that I do recommend this album and I'm very proud of Metallica and I hope the best for them because as I said I love them. I think they're great. 
And I feel like if they really put their mind to it, if Kirk, for example, doesn't lose his phone again, and they all, because this album, you know, it was said by Robert that this was mostly a Lars James effort. And, but I feel like all four of them really work together on the next one. It could be really good, because there's a lot here. There's a lot here. Potential, like I said, there's a lot of potential here to make a good album from eight to 10. A lot of potential, and I feel like if they don't wait like eight years, if they wait like maybe two years at the most to make the next album, I feel the like next album could be really good. It can really blow this one out of the water, but for the time being, look, Metallica, even if Spit Out the Bone was the only song in this album, they really did prove that they still have it in them. They really did prove that they're still one of the best bands out there, and I'm very proud for them. Very happy with the work here on this album. Even the songs I don't like, I'm still happy, you know, <laughs> with the effort that they put forward. Uh, except Kirk. Kirk really needs to work on everything. But everybody else, even little Lars, great job. Rob did a great job, James did a great job. Kirk, okay, you did do a good job on certain songs. I do agree, there was pretty good solos. But you could do a better job. And I'm just, I really like this album, guys. The first half is enough for this album to recommend it, so please listen to that album. Before I go though, I'd like to recommend you guys a podcast. There's this podcast called the Rock and Metal Combat Podcast. I've been a big fan of this podcast. I think they've been going for four years now. And there is an episode every Sunday about a classic uh, rock or heavy metal album that these guys you know, grew up with or are listening to or have come out. And they review albums and they're very funny. They're very, their humor is pretty crude. So if you like get offended easily, don't listen to them. But I think they're really good. I'd like to recommend that to you guys. I'm gonna put in the description the link to their, um, they have their podcast on this site called Podbeam. You can also find it on iTunes and Google Play Music. I personally use Google Play Music. And you should listen to their episodes. They're very funny guys. They are a huge inspiration to me starting this channel. They have their own review of Hardwire. You should listen to that. If you do listen to them, I highly recommend their top 15 worst Motley Crue songs. I think that's their best episode. The fan favorite though is the Guns N' Roses Use Your Illusion episodes. They have part one and part two. Those are huge, huge fan favorites. They're really funny. Part two more than anything, but they're, they're real, that, that episode is really crude. So if you really, really want to go deep, that one, I choose that one. But you know, my favorite is the Motley Crue one. So guys, I guess that's it for this album. So let's move on to my pick of the vid. So guys, now for the pick of the vid, I'd like to recommend you an album. Not like last time where I recommended you an album that was part of that, that band I was reviewing its discography. I don't want to recommend you a Metallica album because you've probably already heard it. So for this pick of the vid, I'd like to recommend the album Dead Winter Dead by the band Sabotage. And this is a really interesting album because it's not part of the classic lineup of Sabotage, but it's a really good album. And again, if you haven't heard it, hear it. If you have, hear it again. It's a great album. Hopefully one day I can review that album. Great album. Great band. Thanks for watching, everyone. Remember to stay metal, stay devil, and stay evil. Alright!